Transcendental functions include functions such as the natural exponential function or exponential functions with other bases, natural logs and ordinary logarithms, and inverse trigonometric functions. In this section, we'll learn how to differentiate inverse trigonometric functions and we'll examine integrals involving inverse trigonometric functions. Before we jump into the calculus of inverse trigonometric functions, let's take an opportunity to review working with inverse trigonometric functions. Let's begin with y equals sine of x. Now, recall that the domain of sine of x is negative infinity to infinity. But if we examine this blue curve here, which represents the graph of sine of x, it does not pass the horizontal line test. Therefore, on its domain from negative infinity to infinity, it is not invertible. So what we're going to do is restrict the domain so that the entire range is exhibited but the restricted domain contains a portion that is one-to-one -one and therefore invertible. So for sine of x, we're going to consider the portion of the graph between x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals pi over 2. Notice on this portion, the range exhibited is negative one-to-one, so all possible range values are contained within this small snippet of the domain. So when we quote the domain here, we're going to be quoting the restricted domain of each of these functions. We're going to restrict them so that they are one-to-one -one and invertible. So in this case, the restricted domain is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. The range doesn't change. It's still negative 1 to 1. Now, if I take that yellow curve and I reflect it across the line y equals x, which you can see graphed there as a dotted black line, then the resulting graph is the graph of the inverse function. We can call it arc sine of x. Equivalently, we can write it as inverse sine of x. Now, the domain and range from ordinary sine reverse for inverse or arc sine. So the domain of the red curve there is negative 1 to 1, and the range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. If you'll remember, pi over 2 is about 1.6, so I can see that this red curve has y values from about negative 1.6 to 1.6, and it has domain values from about 1, negative 1 to positive 1. Now, it is important to know the range of our inverse trig functions because as we review evaluating inverse trig functions, we'll want to evaluate them within their appropriate ranges. Let's do something similar with the cosine wave. You can see the blue curve represents the cosine wave. Now, generally, we restrict the domain of the cosine wave from 0 to pi. This branch is 1 to 1 and therefore invertible. And all possible range values, negative 1 to 1, are exhibited. So we're going to, again, quote only the restricted domain, which in this case is 0 to pi. Notice the brackets on the endpoints there. And the range, of course, is negative 1 to 1. So if we take that yellow branch of the cosine wave and we reflect it across the line y equals x, again represented by that dashed black line, we're going to get that resulting red curve. The domain of that resulting red curve is the range of the original cosine wave. And the range of arc cosine, then, is the domain of the original cosine. Again, you can represent inverse cosine as arc cosine, or you can represent it with your inverse function notation. Now, it's nice to get experience with these graphs, but what you absolutely need to know is the range of each of these inverse trig functions. Let's go ahead and examine tangent. Now, on the graph of tangent, you can see several branches. Recall that the domain of tangent is all real numbers except for odd multiples of pi over 2. You can see on the graph that we're getting asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2. As a whole, the blue graph is not one-to-one -one because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Therefore, it's not invertible on its entire domain. However, we can restrict the domain and just consider, consider this central branch here because that part is one-to-one -one and therefore invertible. Also, that branch contains every possible output of the range, which is negative infinity to infinity. So to invert tangent, we're only going to consider the restricted range 
from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Again, I want to stress these are restricted domains. This is not the actual domain, the entire domain of these uh, trig functions. Do observe on the restricted domain of tangent, we have parentheses instead of brackets like we did for sine. The parentheses are there because at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, there is an asymptote lo located on the graph. Now the range of this yellow branch of tangent is negative infinity to infinity. If we take this yellow branch and we reflect it across the line y equals x, the result is the red curve, which is arc tangent or inverse tangent. Oops, please correct my typo. That should be arc tangent that we're looking at there. The domain of arc tangent is the range of ordinary tangent, which is negative infinity to infinity. And the range of inverse tangent is the domain of ordin the restricted domain of ordinary tangent. And remember, you need a working knowledge of the range of each of these inverse trig functions in order to properly evaluate them. Each of these graphs that we're examining can be generated with your graphing calculator. Make sure that you put your graphing calculator in radian mode, and you can simply type in uh, the inverse trig function. Let's examine the inverse reciprocal trig functions. Doesn't get much more complicated than that. We'll begin with cosecant. Now, I want to remind you the relationship between cosecant and sine. I'm going to sketch the graph of sine. Onto this graph, we're going to have a lot of information on this graph, but it helps to represent or to remember the relationship between cosecant and sine in examining the graph of cosecant. You can see that the blue curve, which is cosecant, bounces off that green curve, which is sine. You can also see that where sine crosses the horizontal, as the horizontal axis, cosecant has a vertical asymptote at those intersection points. Now, we need to restrict the domain of cosecant because as it is, if we imagine it repeating across its entire domain, it is not one-to-one -one or invertible. So we're going to restrict the domain of cosecant just like we restricted the domain of sine. Remember, we took sine from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We're going to do the same thing with cosecant, but notice whenever I take the part of the graph from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, there is an asymptote in the middle. So the domain that we're going to consider for cosecant, restricted domain, is going to start at negative pi over 2 and go to that vertical asymptote. We're going to skip over that vertical asymptote at 0 and then go to pi over 2. Notice the brackets with the pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 and the parentheses with the 0. Again, there is an asymptote at 0. Now, considering the range of the yellow highlighted portion of the graph, we're going to go from negative infinity to negative 1 and then skip over that middle part, negative 1 to infinity. So again, I'm looking at the y values, negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. Now, to find the domain and range of arc cosecant, which can also be written as inverse cosecant of x, we're simply going to reverse those. The domain of arc cosecant then would be negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. Whoops, I have a little error up here on the range. On the range of cosecant, it should be negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. Then the range will be from negative pi over 2 to 0, union 0 to pi over 2. Again, we're dealing with inverse functions, so the domain and range reverse from a function to its inverse function. Moving on to secant, let's examine the relationship between the reciprocal function secant and cosine. Just like cosecant bounces off of sine, secant bounces off of cosine. So I'm going to sketch in my cosine wave here. Notice that where cosine, the green curve, crosses the x-axis, secant has a vertical asymptote. Recall that we restricted the domain of cosine from 0 to pi. 
we're going to restrict the domain of secant in the same way. We're going to consider only the branch from 0 to pi. So I'm going to highlight the portion of the secant that we will be inverting. So the restricted domain is going to go from 0 to pi over 2 where there is an asymptote and then jump over to pi over 2 to pi. The range of secant is the same as the range of cosecant that is negative infinity to negative 1 union negative oh, did it again positive 1 to infinity. Now to imagine the reflection of the yellow portion of this curve across that line y equals x, what we want to recognize is that this branch right here reflects across the line y equals x to match up with this branch here. Okay, Then this branch of our original secant curve reflects across that line y equals x to land on this branch right here. So it's a very interesting, challenging reflection. And because we have the domain and range of secant right here in front of us, to find the domain and range of arc secant, also known as inverse secant, all we have to do is reverse those two originals. So the domain of inverse secant is negative infinity to negative 1, union 1 to infinity, and the range will be from 0 to pi over 2, union pi over 2 to pi. Make sure I get a parenthesis right there at that pi over 2. So as I mentioned earlier, you want to have a working knowledge of the range of the inverse trig functions in order that we evaluate them properly. Let's finish up with the graph of cotangent. Now the blue graph is the graph of cotangent. You can see that there's a vertical asymptote at every integer multiple of pi. But across its entire domain, it's not one-to-one -one and invertible. Therefore, we're only going to consider this branch of cotangent in order to create the inverse function. So our restricted domain will be from 0 to pi. Notice the parentheses there because we have uh, vertical asymptotes at both 0 and pi. Let me re-emphasize here that the domains that we are considering, maybe these weren't the domains you learned in trig because we are restricting them <laughs> restricted domain in both of these cases. The range of cotangent, like tangent, is negative infinity to infinity. So if I reflect that yellow curve across the line y equals x, the result is that red curve. Notice the asymptotes at 0 and pi are reflected now to be horizontal asymptotes at y equals 0 and y equals pi. The domain of inverse cotangent or arc cotangent then is negative infinity to infinity. And the range therefore is 0 to pi. Have a working knowledge of the range of the inverse trig functions and the inverse reciprocal trig functions. Now to digest that information, it's a really good idea to compare and contrast. That's why I have so many graphs on one grid. What's the relationship between secant and cosine, inverse secant, inverse cosine, so on and so forth. Now how does this help us prepare for the derivatives and integrals that we're going to be finding soon? In some cases, especially in the case of a definite integral, you'll need to be able to evaluate these inverse trig functions within their appropriate ranges. So let's begin to evaluate these inverse trig functions within the range. Keep in mind your calculator will always yield values that are in the appropriate range. Um, also remember, we will evaluate exactly in radians. The first one is to evaluate arc sine of negative square root of 2 over 2. First of all, let's recall that the range of arc sine, as we saw earlier, is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. 
Also remember that when we're dealing with an inverse trig function, the result is an angle or an arc. What goes into the inverse trig function is a ratio. What comes out is some sort of angle. So I need to figure out the angle on the unit circle whose sine value is negative square root of 2 over 2. And I want to work within the range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now, if I work from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, essentially, I'm going to be working in quadrant 1 and quadrant 4 of the unit circle. So I want to figure out, of those angles, which one has a sine value or a y-coordinate of negative square root of 2 over 2. Now, if I look down here in quadrant 4, it appears to be 7 pi over 4, but 7 pi over 4 is not in the range between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So instead of naming this angle 7 pi over 4, I'm going to name it with its equivalent negative pi over 4. So arc sine, or inverse sine, of negative square root of 2 over 2 is negative pi over 4. It's very important that I evaluate these inverse trig functions within the range, especially when I'm working in a definite integral. If I use 7 pi over 4 in place of negative pi over 4, I'd end up with the wrong evaluation. So much to think about on these basic trig evaluations. Let's work on inverse secant of 2 square root of 3 over 3. The range of inverse secant was from 0 to pi over 2 and pi over 2 to pi. Remember, it's very similar to cosine. Cosine we restrict from 0 to pi. I'm doing the same thing here. I just happen to be leaving out pi over 2. This indicates that I'm going to be working in quadrants 1 and 2 of the unit circle. So I need to find an angle between 0 and pi, not including pi over 2, whose secant value is 2 square root of 3 over 3. Now, I prefer to think about cosine, right? If cosine is square root of 3 over 2, then secant is going to be 2 square root of 3 over 3, simply because we would invert the cosine and rationalize it. So I need an angle here with a cosine value of square root of 3 over 2, because when I invert that to get secant, I would end up with 2 square root of, two over square root of 3, and then when I rationalize, I'd end up with 2 square root of 3 over 3. So it looks like the angle that we're interested in here is pi over 6. So inverse secant of 2 square root of 3 over 3 is pi over 6. If you evaluate that with your calculator in degrees, you would get exactly 30 degrees. If you evaluate that with your calculator in radians, it's going to give you the decimal approximation of pi over 6. Keep in mind you want to be able to evaluate this exactly in radians. Let's practice an arc tangent. The first thing I want to think about is the range of arc tangent. It's very close to the range for inverse sine, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, but we have parentheses around the angles. So when we look at our unit circle, we're going to find an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose tangent value, or whose inverse tangent value, is square root of 3. Recall that tangent is evaluated by taking the y-coordinate and dividing by the x-coordinate. So if I take this y-coordinate and I divide by this x-coordinate, I'm going to end up with the angle of question. That reduces to negative square root of 3. So the angle that we're interested in here has to fit within the range. It's not 5 pi over 3. We'll call it negative 5 pi over 3. So arc tangent of negative square root of 3 is negative pi over 3. All right, let's try some compositions. The same skills, but now we're going to be embedding an inverse trig function within an ordinary trig function. So we always want to work from the inside out. Let's begin with tangent of arc cosine of the square root of 2 over 2. So We'll begin by evaluating arc cosine of square root of 2 over 2. Remember, when I evaluate an inverse trig function, I'm looking for an angle or an arc. So I need an angle on the unit circle between 0 and pi, whose cosine or x-coordinate is square root of 2 over 2. So obviously here we're going to end up with pi over 4. So arc cosine of square root of 2 over 2, two gives us pi over 4. Now we're going to evaluate tangent of pi over 4. 
tangent of pi over 4, we simply go to pi over 4 on the unit circle, we divide the y coordinate by the x coordinate, and clearly we would end up with a value of 1. Now on example B, we don't want to think too hard about this one. We could start by evaluating inverse cosine of 1, figuring out where on the unit circle is the x coordinate equal to 1, and calculate that angle and plug it into cosine. Or we can recognize that we have the composition of two inverse functions here. When you compose two inverse functions, remember, you always end up with the same argument that you began with. So if we recognize this is the composition of two inverse functions, we can easily evaluate that to be 1 without ever even thinking about the unit circle. Now the next one's going to be the most challenging because if you'll notice in the argument, we do not have a unit circle value, but we'll still be able to evaluate this exactly. That means without rounding using our calculator. So what we want to recognize is that we have some angle represented by arc cotangent of negative 5 twelfths. So I'm going to say that angle, let's just call it theta. So sum theta equals arc cotangent of negative 5 twelfths. What that means is cotangent of this angle is negative 5 twelfths, and my job is to figure out what that angle is. Well, we don't know the angle, but let's assume that it is on a right triangle somewhere. Cotangent is the ratio of x divided by y. So this side would be 5, this side would be 12. For now, I'm going to ignore the sign and just look at the absolute value of that cotangent. If we apply Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we'd be able to solve for the hypotenuse to get 13. Now let's factor in the negative on that negative 5 twelfths. Recall that the range of arc cotangent is 0 to pi. So that covers quadrants 1 and 2. So where is cotangent negative? Well, it's negative in quadrant 2, right? Because the x values are negative, the y values are positive. So I need to find an angle in quadrant 2 with a cotangent of negative 5 twelfths. Again, we're not going to be able to get that angle exactly, but we do know that this is going to be a quadrant 2 angle. Okay, next, whatever that angle happens to be, we've got it listed right here in our triangle, we want to find cosecant of that angle. Cosecant is 1 over sine. Remember, the, the sine value is the y-coordinate. Remember, we can calculate uh, sine from a right triangle using the SOHCAHTOA technique. Sine of theta will be opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of whatever this angle is, is 12 over 13. However, if we are in quadrant 2, then sine is going to definitely be positive. Then we can evaluate 1 over sine of theta to get cosecant, which is 13 twelfths. So we really had to jump through a lot of hoops to get that last evaluation, but this is exactly what we're going to be doing um, in some of our integration techniques. So let's do this in a more general way. Let's evaluate these next compositions algebraically using that same process. Example A is cosine of inverse sine of x. Well, we don't know inverse sine of x, but we do know it represents some angle. Let's go ahead and put that angle on a right triangle. So if this is theta, we could say inverse sine of x equals theta. Therefore, this angle that I'm looking for, this uh, ratio is sine of theta. Sine of theta equals x. Remember, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Using our Pythagorean theorem, we could solve for this side to get square root of 1 minus x squared. Now we need to evaluate cosine of this angle. We're attempting to evaluate cosine of inverse sine, or we can shorten it to cosine of theta. We've recognized theta as this angle on the right triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so cosine would be square root of 1 minus x squared. Therefore, cosine of inverse sine of x is the square root of 1 minus x squared. 
It's the same process as the previous example, just happens to be in algebraic form. Let's try example B. Sine of 2 arc cosine of x. Well, let's suppose that theta equals arc cosine of x. So we are attempting to evaluate sine of 2 theta. Well, we can rewrite this with our double angle identity. That's 2 sine theta cosine of theta. Now, let's go back and plug arc cosine in for theta. So we need to evaluate 2 sine of arc cosine of x cosine of arc cosine of x. Now, this last one is going to be really easy to evaluate because notice we have the composition of a function with its inverse function. So that's simply going to evaluate to be x. However, this portion we're going to have to use a right triangle to evaluate. Arc cosine of x equals some angle theta. So we'll put that angle on a right triangle. Now, if theta equals arc cosine of x, then cosine of theta equals x. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Therefore, we could use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for this vertical segment, which would be square root of 1 minus x squared. So we need to find sine of this angle. Sine is opposite over adjacent, and we can see from the triangle that's 2 times the square root of 1 minus x squared. So cleaning up our answer, we have 2x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. This process will be a necessary step when we deal with integrals involving inverse trig functions. So nice to have that review before we move on.